All right, John. Welcome again to Portland. Good to be here. Good to have you back. Always good to be here. Yep, it's great to have you here. Great to have you on the podcast again. So we just got finished teaching. You got finished teaching a seminar here. Yep. And we want to tell the people about this is you just finished your first ever instructional set. Yep. And you shot it here with Port in Portland. It's going to be going up through for SBGU people. Correct. They'll be able to get it. Yep. And then you're going to, in a week or two, you're going to do another set with BJJ Fanatics on a different topic, right? Right. Cool. So your seminar and your instructional series were on the universal sprawl. Correct. And, and what's interesting to me about that is like when I teach, I'm often trying to teach based on position. <clears throat> but but as you and I have talked about many times, there's just a few fundamental movements right. in jiu-jitsu, maybe a dozen. And instead of talking about a position, you took one of those movements and showed how it how it operated in uh, in all different positions, right. which is a, which is a, I've not seen that done before. Right. It was, it was a really good seminar. So why don't you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Why you did that? So. Uh, I think there's two reasons. One is it's the way I see jujitsu and the way I try to learn and teach jujitsu. And the other is, like you said, it's like you have videos out, Henry, John Donner, there's a lot of really excellent coaches with videos out that catalog a certain position. What are your options for mount attacks? What are your options for passing guard? What are your options for escaping from the back? You know, and I learn a lot from those. Um, but I, I don't want to be redundant. I think a lot of the good information is already out there. Right. And so the way I look at it is whether you're on top or bottom, offense or defense, there, there are these certain fundamental postures and movement patterns. And so I try to take one of those and translate it across a lot of different technical situations, offensive, defensive, top and bottom. I just feel like for me it's an easier way to retain information and as a teacher to convey information and so I'm doing that and then yeah, that's what we did in Portland for BJJ Fanatics, it's going to be the iron pillow and all the ways that you can use that one posture and movement pattern, which was my seminar last year anyway. Right, right. It was interesting because you gave homework to the class at the seminar and one of your homework pieces was to find other places where there was a universal sprawl, yeah. which is good because you're, you you're encouraging the students to actively look for that movement. Right. And I, I couldn't even get through all my notes. It would have just been ridiculously long. Sure. Even if I had, it, it wouldn't even begin to touch on because jujitsu is evolving. And, right. Yeah, I want people to sort of educate themselves and have the knowledge to, to find it on their own, right? Right. Yeah. You know, one thing you and I have talked a lot about is fundamentals, and people who follow SBG here on SBGU are probably tired of me hearing, hearing me talk about it, but the curriculum for SBG has always been about aliveness, and then the, the physical techniques, we're talking about fundamentals. And with yeah. jiu-jitsu, when we talk about fundamentals, we're talking about things that are efficient, right. um, and we're looking for the most efficient option, and universal, and, you know, it's going to apply to self-defense, ski, and no ski. Okay. But very often when I see instructors teach, even some of my own black belts, yeah. other, other jiu-jitsu coaches, so often it turns into a chain of movements. Sure. Which is, and very often it's, it's that instructor's personal game. Right. And, I, and I've tried hard over the years to steer people away from that. Sometimes it can be a little bit, um, depressing is not the right word, but a little bit... Frustrating right. that you know, it, it seems to be rare. Like you're one right. of the you're one of the few coaches, even within the organization, who sticks to just fundamentals. Right. Why is it such a hard thing to get across to people? I don't know. Uh, it's hard for me, even sometimes. Like today, filming the the DVD was like tempting. Tempting you're to go in, in the other front stuff. headlock, and now it's like I can show you 17 cool submissions right. from here. <laughs> And it's seductive because you want to show all the yes. cool stuff you can do from a position. Yeah. But, and I've told you this before, it's, it's like teaching at the university. I actually hinder my students yes. by showing them my game. So just the, the university analogy is it's my job as a professor of jiu-jitsu and a professor at the university to be doing my own cutting-edge research. Right. But it's not my job to demand that my students try to learn that when what they really need is the fundamentals that are allowing me to do my cutting edge research. Right. And I need to give them what they need to do what I'm doing on a separate and parallel track, not to copy me. Right. Yeah, and great. so it's hard because you, you're you doing this research in jujitsu or, or in academia and it, 
you find it compelling, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Right. It's what I think is both fun and effective and important. Right. But I don't want to force that onto anyone else, and, and I do them a disservice sometimes by forcing it onto them. Right, that's a very good analogy, and that, I think that is a big part of it. I think part of it, too, is just that's how everybody teaches, right? Right. With very rare exceptions. So right. if you go to most classes, a lot of the students will have learned that way. Right. So it's almost a habit you have to unlearn. Yeah. So we've talked before, when we talk about fundamentals, we talk about jujitsu. One thing I heard you say many times is that you're very picky with your, your jujitsu. Yeah. And you and I have both been training quite a bit recently with Henry, who's yeah. also part of SBG. And, and part of that is that that line of Hickson's jiu-jitsu that yeah. seems to be um, so efficient. Yes. A and in so many ways, it it's kind of personifies everything that we've talked about jiu-jitsu jiu -jitsu should be. Right. So um, talk to me a little bit about that. How do you think of Hickson's jiu-jitsu as being different from uh, much of what we've seen or much of what, what you've right. done in the past? I think... Um, it is more efficient in a couple of ways, like really demonstrable ways. One that's obvious, regardless of what movements are being done, uh, most of what he and Henry <coughs> are teaching will have between two and four steps. So it's efficient in that way, both in terms of ease of learning and retention on the student's part, but also in the middle of a real fight, whether that's a fight with rules in a tournament or, or a self-defense situation, I think, you know, it's, it's just demonstrably more difficult to recall a 17-step, I mean, just mentally, to recall 17 steps in a row under pressure than it is three or four. And even if you're a genius and you have total recall and muscle memory, it's inefficient in the sense that you can get through 13 steps and if your opponent realizes what you're doing and stops you at 14 or 15, you just wasted a lot of time and energy. Right. So I think it's efficient on the front end in terms of learning and retention and on the back end in terms of execution. And that, that's regardless of the movements. And then when I see the movements themselves, to me they're the they're most economical, the most commonsensical, best weight distribution, best angle, things that a lot of other people don't have. I mean. There's not a lot of dependence on grips, yep. so it translates well to nogi and self-defense. Um, it translates into not being injured all the time yep. uh, because you're not gripping all the time. Um, it, it forces you to have better weight distribution and better angles and better posture because you're not relying on grips. And mm -hmm. Grips is, a, it's, it's one, the smallest, weakest bones and muscles in your body. Right. But it's also, even if those hold up, it's just a way of transferring into a kind of bodybuilding jujitsu, right? Right. Whereas when you're not gripping so much, it's it's more on the top weight distribution angle and on the bottom posture. Right. Right. Not I'm gonna grab you and push you away, but I'm gonna configure my body in such a way that I can transfer your energy through me into the ground. Right. So I just think no matter what angle I examine that jujitsu from, to me it's the best. And we talked also in the car about People make a logical error by saying, but look at athlete A, he makes that game work. Or right. look at athlete B, she makes that game work. And it's a different argument, right? They, they're, they're confusing the argument. I, I didn't say certain people couldn't make it work. That's like the people who say, but my Aunt Betty smoked five packs of cigarettes a day and drank two bottles of scotch and yeah. she lived till 100. Yeah. And it's like, but she might have lived to 130 and won 10 Olympic gold medals because she has such great genetics. Right. It's not an argument for that as proper nutrition, you know? Sure. So, yeah. Sure, and likewise, somebody that has very efficient jiu-jitsu losing to someone else is not evidence that their jiu-jitsu is less efficient. Right. It's just evidence that on that day they were right. not, not the top opponent. So, right. Talk to me about connection, because when people talk about the difference between Hickson's jiu-jitsu, you know, the word that comes up all the time is connection, and it's, it can be difficult to, yeah. to articulate. I think many of us have slightly different ways of talking about the yeah. same thing, so how do you explain that to your students when you're talking so, to so them about it? I try to demystify connection, and I'll start with, I'll go from Hickson to Henry to me. So with Hickson, I think it's part I think there's three parts 
to Hickson's approach that can make it a little difficult. One, he didn't so much learn jiu-jitsu as an adult as he absorbed it as a child. Yeah. And so it's like learning a second language versus being a native speaker. Okay. You are doing everything right, but not really conscious of why you're doing it right. Right. And secondly, uh, he's, I think, temperamentally an artist. And thirdly, he's a non-native speaker of English. Henry is the next generation who learned jiu-jitsu as an adult. So he's learning it as a second language. I don't think he's super gifted as an athlete, and I, and I don't, I mean, he's a martial artist, but I don't think he has that art, artist temperament. Right. And so Henry helped me demystify it quite a bit, and, and then the, the only addition that I made, which helps my students, is I tell them, if you're not sure, A, what connection is, or B, if you're connected, the, the way to, to know is that if, if you are connected, and you move a millimeter, your opponent should be moving a millimeter. If you right. move a foot, your opponent should be moving a foot. Right. Nothing gets lost. Yeah. All energy is transferred. Yeah. Offensively and defensively. You know, the jiu-jitsu world's almost divided generationally by the older generation of us, who are old now, who were around when Hickson was in his prime. Right. And many of us got to train with him. You got a blue belt under him just like I did. And another generation who's not had access to him, right. haven't seen him, haven't seen his people competing in tournaments other than maybe Kron, his son, right. and don't buy into um, the argument that his jiu-jitsu is in, in, in many ways technically superior sure. because of efficiency. Um, what would you say to, to, that, to that younger generation right. about that? So I, I would separate that into two. One, one is how good he was as a competitor or fighter, whether he's competing or not. I mean, all you have to do is, is see the interviews with a lot of people who rolled with him even when he was in his 40s, world champions. Right. Like, it's pretty unequivocal. Yeah. But, but more importantly, because you know, he's retired now and it's more his jiu-jitsu legacy through Henry and through SVG and stuff, um, I didn't start training with Henry until probably about six years ago, five years ago. So I was already a third degree black belt and I had already trained in Brazil a couple times, trained in Japan, trained in Korea, trained in America, gone to train with a lot of famous people, a lot of good people. And you know, um, I, wanted, I wanted to train with Henry and I did. And if his jujitsu hadn't been qualitatively different, which is to say qualitatively better, I would have just trained with him and said, hey, thanks and good to meet you. And I would have not had a relationship with him. I mean, we might've been like, email every once in a while, whatever. I wouldn't have felt the need to go spend a week with him in Thailand, to buy all of his uh, digital material, which I have. I basically own everything he's ever put out, to go to any seminar that I can. I mean, I live overseas, but anytime I have a chance. And that, that's like my own judgment and not, not on the internet, on a keyboard. That's with my own time, with time. my own money, with my own energy. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's just because um, his expression of Hickson's jiu-jitsu is the best I've ever seen or felt or experienced. And so, I mean, I, if, if, you, if you think, if, if a, someone says that I'm lying yeah. or that I don't understand jiu-jitsu, well, the conversation's over. Right. But if they trust me to be honest and they've done any jiu-jitsu with me and they know that I understand jiu-jitsu pretty well, then they should... I guess that's enough. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I think sometimes people might mistake the conversations we have or when we talk about that kind of jiu-jitsu as us discounting in some way modern jiu-jitsu, which we're not. Nope. And you and I spent quite a bit of time talking this weekend, and you were talking a little bit about um, how impressed you were with Donaher. Yep. And we both talked about how impressive Gordon Ryan looks. Yep. Like he looks like he's playing with his food right now. Yep. So... Talk to me a bit about that. What, what are your opinions on that team and that kind of like new school so, of jiu-jitsu? So, yeah, the, the interesting thing, so there's all kinds of modern jiu-jitsu, right? Yeah. And I don't really go in as much for all the worm guard and uh, barambolo, although I, I don't stop my students from doing it. It's just mm -hmm. nothing I really want to specialize in. Right. Uh, what what Donaher and his team are doing is a little bit different. It's it's modern and it's focused a little bit extra on submission grappling, 
They have MMA fighters, they have gi fighters, but it's focused a lot on no gi submission grappling. Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi, Eddie Bravo type rules. The difference is, I think they that what I what I really like about what he does, at least what I've seen, I haven't seen all of his stuff, but what I've seen on the leg game and the front headlock guillotine game is that he, John Donner, has has found a really good way to make that into jujitsu, to take it from the old uh, shoot fighting or catch wrestling where two guys grab each other's legs, sloppily roll around, and the person with less, less mobility, <laughs> less flexibility, less luck, his knee goes first. Right. Whereas he's done a very good job of making it like, I'm mounted on you. It's very clear who's winning. Right. I may or may not be able to finish you, but you're more or less 100% on defense, and I'm more or less 100% on offense. Mm -hmm. You are more or less 100% in danger, and I'm more or less 100% safe. Absent a few tricks that don't work very well or very often, right? Right. And he's done that with the leg lock game to a, to a really high degree, and I really respect that. So he's made it positional. Positional, and, and whether they finish or not, they're, they're attaining and maintaining positions of advantage where they're more or less safe, the opponent is more or less in complete danger, and can hand fight and do all kinds of things to stall but it's not that we're both in equal danger and whoever gets unlucky is going to blow their knee out. Yeah. That's and you see his guys, particularly Gordon Ryan, but all his guys, finishing in a very gentle way. Yes. The way you could finish a choke from mount. You Always don't have controlled. to punch someone in the teeth from mount if you yeah. can slowly choke them. Yeah. And they're looking at their partners or their opponents and saying, like, you understand this is over. Please tap before I have to hurt you. Right. Which to me, and if the person chooses to get hurt, that's on them. Right. But it's not that like grip it and rip it and they roll and they get out or they don't roll and they go to the hospital. It's right. very much uh, plugged back into or modified so that it is able to be plugged back into the original jujitsu philosophy that attracted me so much, which is position first, hold and dominate, and then Control. finish as gently or as roughly as you choose. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. You come to the States usually once a year. Sometimes twice. Sometimes yeah. twice, and you're here for a while, and you travel around and give different seminars. You'll be in uh, Boise next weekend yep. at SBG Idaho, and then you'll be in, um, you were in SBG Texas the week yep. before you were here, and then you'll be in, uh, where, uh, Kalispell the week after SBG Boise. SBG Montana, yeah. ultimately in the East Coast, with right. SBG East Coast with Steve Whittier. So we get to see you there, but what's your what's your training like when you're in Korea? What's a what's a what's a typical month like for? It's John funny. Franklin? I was training probably like averaging four days a week for a long time, and I was just because on any given day I'd be like, well, I don't feel like it today, or I just want to stay home today. And and COVID hit. Yeah. And our gyms over there got closed a couple times, sometimes for two weeks, sometimes for four weeks, but there were a couple closures, three or four closures actually. Well, the downside is obvious, you know, you, the gym's closed. Right. We snuck in a little bit in small groups, but it was closed, you know, for, for formal training. But the upside was it made me realize how precious jujitsu was to me. So since it lifted in Korea about several months ago, and I've been training like six and seven days a week, not hard, you know, just mellow, but I, I never feel like missing a day anymore, which is was a good side of being forced to miss it and realizing that, wow, this is really important to me. So these days, like the last half year or so, I've been I've been training basically more or less every day, maybe six days a week, sometimes twice. But I'm teaching and I'm training light, so it's not like four hours of hard training. When you say training every day, what's a typical training day for you? So I go in and teach. Um, How many days a week do you teach? Well, it's up to me. I'm not on any schedule, but I'll usually go to my main academy um, just about every day. They have a 11 a.m. class and a noon class, and so sometimes I'll do I'll teach both those classes. Sometimes I'll just do the 11 a.m. and then kind of do my own warm down and stretching during the noon class. Um, but I'll I'll usually be there Monday through Friday, okay. and then Saturdays there's team training, and I go and I teach that, and then Sundays is sort of optional. But yeah, I, I feel like training a lot more now that I was forced not to train. Sure. Yeah, it feels more valuable to me. Uh, 
And how old are you now? 54? 54. So 54, training seven days a week is pretty good. Yeah, and it's easy because I don't smash myself. You know. Right. And that's an important point for people who know you and people who've been around SBG and got to take classes with you, with you for a long time. Know that already, but people who may not be familiar with you, you've always had a very, uh, a very uh, particular philosophy about training. Yeah. Right. Which is one. Well, well, you articulate that. So I, I, you know, I learned this from Hickson. It was really important to get my blue belt from Hickson because he and the instructors under him were super, super adamant about using the technique, not about winning, right. but using jujitsu. And you, people would win with bench pressing and football and whatever they were doing. And he would stop class very like proactive and very like interjectionist. He's just like, that's not jujitsu. You didn't learn that from me. Well, well, I tapped him or they would say something dumb. And he says, I didn't say that. I said, it's not jujitsu and you right. didn't learn it from me. Yeah. Right. Um, Whereas I think a lot of gyms are kind of like, oh, they'll learn in time, and they let people develop those bad habits. Yeah, it's funny you say he was proactive that way. Yeah, yeah. And so from the beginning, it was kind of drilled into me that it's like, you're here to do jujitsu. Yeah. I don't care if you tap 20 times if you're trying to do jujitsu. Right. And I don't care if you tap someone 20 times if you're not using jujitsu. Like right. you already wrestled, or you did judo, or you're big and strong, and you tap that, it's meaningless because you didn't learn it as part of jujitsu, right? Right. So I was lucky enough to have that from the beginning and smart enough to keep it. And so I, I remember very clearly at white belt and blue belt tapping all the time because I was just trying to do what was showed to me in any situation. At purple belt, it kind of evened out. And at brown belt, it just started working. You yes. know, it just started working. And the guys who were still doing what they beat me with at blue belt, I could play with them. And they, most of them quit. A lot of them are just crummy black belts because they still have all those bad habits. Most of them quit, though. And so, I was, yeah, I was lucky enough to have that and lucky enough to believe it. And so I've always, and I try to teach my students, it's like I would 200% rather have myself and my students lose with jiu-jitsu than win without jiu-jitsu. And then, ironically, they start winning more if sure. they do that. You know? Sure. It's funny, though, you mentioned that there's a... Uh, there's a different learning curve that way, mm -hmm. where you're going to lose more early on. You have to accept that. And you have to accept that. It's like, and some people can't accept they that. They can't. And then, but, but they pay for it later on. Yeah. But it's, it's like, we're talking, when we say later on, we're talking like 10 years. But it takes a while, right? Yeah. yeah. Or five, but it five takes a while. Five. Yeah. And yeah, that's really interesting. But it had a, it's also kept your body healthy. Yes. Which is good. So you can stay on the mat. Right. You know, I think I was telling you with my recent injuries and stuff, my attitude towards training shifted to the point where when I thought maybe I wasn't going to be able to roll ever, and I'm thinking, man, all I want to do is be able to roll. I don't care about anything else. Yeah. I just want to be able to roll. Right. Completely changed my point of view on it. And that's a little bit related to what I was saying about COVID. When, yeah. so, when you're somehow forced off the mat, yeah, you realize it. the only important thing is jujitsu. It's yes. not about winning or losing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I just want to be able to roll. Yeah. Yes. I want to be able to train and teach and roll. Yeah. yeah, that's huge. Your top advice for all the new students out there who are watching, people who are going to come take a start starting their jujitsu yeah, career, what yeah. are you going to tell them? Just what we just talked about, you know, um, trust the technique, uh, use the technique. It's always better to tap using technique than to tap someone else without technique because that will end sooner or later. Right. Um, and, you know, if, if you do that and you, you trust the process and you're willing to be a white belt and you're willing to be a blue belt, which means by definition most of the gym is better than you and you're going to tap a lot. Right. But you consider tapping part of the learning process. Not You're never winning or losing in the gym, right? right. You're just learning anyway. So, yeah, that's all. It's so simple. Um, and the other part of that is stay healthy, but that's also part of staying healthy because sure. if, if you're holding on to things for too long, inevitably you're going to get injured. Right. And if you just treat it more like it's an art and we're doing it together, and if you catch me and I respect that, I'm like, okay, I respect that. Right. Let's start over. Right. My arm is not broken. My neck is not tweaked. Right. I gave you credit for, you know, what you did, and then we start over, and you do that forever without getting injured, you know? Yeah. You know, change subjects a little bit from jujitsu, but not everybody might realize you had a very similar background to a lot of the older SBG coaches, and yep. that 
you came from the Jeet Kune Do community, mm -hmm. um, and you trained with Dan Inasano back at the Inasano Academy. Mm -hmm. I think, was it prior to learning Jiu Jitsu or? Simultaneous. Simultaneously. And, um, and I, it, it's, you and I talk about that sometimes, and I just, our last podcast, I had an interview with Tim Tackett, right. and I talked to him. And talk to me a little bit about what you think of, you know, you, you've had 30 years now since, since you were doing that to look right. back. What do you think of the Jeet Kune Do community and, and what happened and, right, right. and how it evolved differently that way? Yeah, so I mean, they, they made a really healthy and necessary break from traditional martial arts. Right. And they helped a lot of people, myself included, to also make that break. Because I started with traditional martial arts, like so many people. Right. It's all that was available. I lived in a pretty small town, and I did what was available. And then I lived in a bigger town, but I was still doing a pretty traditional martial art. And after you do that for several years, you, you come up against the limitations of that training method. Yeah. And you either act on your real experience, which is, this doesn't work, right. or you kind of bury your head in the sand and say, I just need to do more kata or you know, more breathing or something. And I was looking for, I was in the former category, so I started with Thai boxing and some Filipino martial arts, and that was good, it was a good break for me. And that wasn't... And this was at the Inasano? No, camp? no, that was in Berkeley, and neither of these people were JKD people. Okay. It was a pure Thai boxer, and he, he was from uh, Malaysia, but the Thai border where they had a lot of contact. And Jeff Finder, who was doing uh, Serata Escrima, pure, not, not JKD concepts. And that was a nice break from traditional martial arts and a nice introduction. And then I moved to LA because I wanted to do Jiu Jitsu and I wanted to do more Thai boxing and Filipino martial arts. And the you Inosano know, Academy had all that under one roof. Not the Jiu Jitsu at that point, but. <laughs> Hickson's for Jiu Jitsu and the Inusano Academy for everything else. Right. And as I was training at both places, I, I just felt like um, the JKD people had, like I said, they made a healthy and necessary break, but then they got fossilized in their own way and stopped in their own way. Um, one step beyond what they were criticizing, but they didn't keep moving forward. Yeah. And I'm sure there are lots of individual exceptions. But you know what I saw there as a rule was Thai boxing being practiced through kata more or less, and you know JKD still relying heavily on certain preset sequences or wooden dummy sets or things like that, and a little bit of sparring, but but not as much as I wanted, and not as realistically as I wanted. And so I naturally during that year went from here to gravitating more and more and more towards Hickson's and less towards what was going on at the Inasano Academy. Right. And what do you think now as you look back 30 years later and we look and you and I often comment, oh, you know, every once in a while we see something come up in news feed or social media and the magazines, it seems to be the same. Yes. It's the same material that we were looking at 30 years ago. Right. So they, they have become a traditional martial art. Yeah. Right. Um, they're, they're just um, a newer version. But uh, they, they have many of the same trappings and, and uh, issues that traditional martial arts have. Yeah. Why do you think that happened? And so quickly, within uh, the same generation? Who... Yeah, I think... Because um, I mean, I'm asked that all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it, it, for me, it's just a guess. I have no idea. But if I had to guess, I would say that people who might have changed it from the inside left. You know, there's that whole idea of voice versus exit. Sure. And I kind of exited, and you exited. And not without a little bit of trying, but, but you know, the people who really see what they're doing as less than ideal have exited. And so, by definition, you're left with people who don't see it as problematic and just keep it going, right? Right. Interesting. Well, anything else you want to talk about? This is kind of a non sequitur, but it popped up earlier and then we got interrupted. Do it. Um, I was talking about 99%. So, you know, 99% of people who do jiu-jitsu will never do it as well or as hard as, you know, the people who are pro athletes under, under Donaher or, or, you know, at, at uh, Atos or whatever who, who have, you know, gone into homeschooling and quit their jobs and everything. Uh, 
and it, it reminded me of something you and I have talked about that I kind of want to get on tape about uh, a lot of fallacies in jiu-jitsu. So the one I use, because uh, I will be teaching, so in Boise, I'm going to teach a seminar on shoulder rotation, and a lot, a lot of that will have to do with headlocks and how important it is, like engaging the shoulder and rotating the shoulders is super important. And what headlocks gave me is what I call the 99% fallacy. And I think we talked about this, but it's like 99% of jiu-jitsu schools don't teach headlock escapes because 99% of trained jiu-jitsu fighters don't do headlocks. But that's a fallacy because 99% of the world doesn't do jiu-jitsu. Right. And 99% of the world that doesn't ju do jiu-jitsu will immediately headlock you right. after they miss a punch. Yeah, right? exactly. And so it's all backwards. You know, yes. when, you, when you're training for the 1%, right. whether that's elite fighters in, in, or, or, or how, however you do that, you're missing what, what really, that's the exception, not the rule. Yes. And so I think it's really important when you, when you design curriculum or when you portion your own resources, time and energy, for your own training or teaching your students to not get caught up in just watching videos of pro fighters and thinking that's really what jiu-jitsu is. Yes. Right. And so, yeah. And what's interesting about that is, um, you know, usually if you're at a good Brazilian jiu-jitsu school that does focus on some self-defense aspect of it. You're going to get that maybe the first six months or a year, right? You're going to get the stuff that you would use in a fight. What we right. always talk about is white belt jiu-jitsu, right. which is the best jiu-jitsu. Right. And then inevitably, if, it, as you stay with it, it becomes jiu-jitsu versus jiu-jitsu. Right. Yeah, so I remember very clearly, uh, it wasn't Hickson, but Luis, who's now in Maui, and he was one of my main instructors because Hickson was in and out. When I was there, Hickson was fighting pro in Japan and was doing a lot of his own training. So I'd see him twice a week, and the other days he'd be doing his own training and popping in at different hours. So trained a lot with Luis, and uh, he said very clearly before I got my blue belt, it's like, up to blue belt is for basically self-defense and fighting, and unless you are unlucky and you meet like a D1 college wrestler, you're basically, if you get a blue belt, at least from Hickson, you're gonna be able to handle yourself against some drunken guy in a bar. And, Which is very true. Yeah, it is absolutely true. And he said, and after that, it's because you love jujitsu and you want to actually do it on a higher level yep. when people know your game and can counter your game. And you know, now I think that's that's the way I learned it. I still repeat that to my students, and it's totally correct. The only problem or potential error in that situation is that people after blue belt never revisit that stuff. Right. And that's a problem. That is a huge problem. So. The curriculum should be designed to give people that as early as possible because it's the best, ju best jujitsu, but it should be cycled back through forever. I couldn't agree yeah. more, and that's what we try and do at SPG. Yeah. But the other thing I, I see is sometimes <clears throat> with the self-defense material, there's a tendency to want to train it in a manner that's not alive. Right. Uh, and uh, I don't understand the reasoning behind it right. because because all of it is is things that you can drill. Yes. Um, but you can see it. I can see it even sometimes in the way Hickson would show the self-defense as compared to the way he would show the jiu-jitsu. Yes. Um, you can see it in the early curriculum with Horian. Yes. Right? Where it's a very rigid kind of system. It looks like exactly what they would have learned from Japanese jiu-jitsu. Exactly. Fossilized. Exactly. And yeah. then when they go to the ground, they turn it Brazilian. Yeah. It becomes alive. Yeah. yeah. Why? Okay, why so to Hickson's credit, he's obviously realized this because in his newer stuff, Yeah. He does take the time once or twice to say, here's how you add pressure once someone's better. Yes. Here's how you up the intensity once someone's better. So yes. he has slightly worked it. I think yes. it could be better articulated, yeah. but he's he's aware of it and he's slowly adding, which is good. Yeah. But at the same time, he also has a competition where right. you're scored on points yes. by how it looks. Yeah. And and that that becomes basically two-man kata. Yes. You know? And I don't like that. Yeah, I don't either. I know what he's doing. He's trying to include more people. And include more people, and I think he's you right. you think that's what it is? I think so. I think, I think Hickson's very interested in, in sort of a soft landing with the assumption, which may or may not be correct, that once you get them in, they'll be able to eventually reach the jiu-jitsu that he wants them to reach. But people also, and you see this in in every game, and Glenn has a rule for it, I forget what it's called, 
people will accommodate themselves to the rule set. Right. And so if you make the, if, if you reward kata, people will focus on it. Right. Right, yeah. Well, one, one last thing I want to make sure we talk about. Yeah. What do you hope people are going to get from your instructional series? Like, why did, you hadn't shot an instructional series before. Nope. So you always taught in person, so you chose to do one now. Yeah. What is it you want uh, people who pick it up? Right, so there's, so there's, there's a micro goal and a macro goal. The micro goal, because this is all universal sprawl, is that they learn a lot of cool ways to utilize this one posture movement pattern, just what I showed them, but also that they're not dependent on that and they can go on and discover, because I, like I said, I, I covered a small fraction of the places in Jiu Jitsu where this appears, right. that they will get good at recognizing it for themselves. And then the macro version is, it, and this my own series is is designed this way, is that they will have this as a potential approach to jujitsu. So, an approach. So an approach to jujitsu that's based around the fundamental postures and movements that make jujitsu work or not work, and approach jujitsu that way rather than as, in other words, collection of techniques. Why versus how. Yes. And okay. and what makes this work rather than how do I grab your wrist and then how do I grab your elbow right. and four fingers in or thumb in and this is important but less so. Right. So that they have a, a better understanding of why jujitsu. I think you, I think you accomplished works. it because yeah, yeah. I, I watched obviously it was took your seminar this weekend and the students were all getting it. And, Good. and now how could they not then start to see different different right. movements in different positions right, right. and start to put it together. So I, I really do think it's a really good, a really good approach. Yeah, I think. Yeah. John, I drove you through downtown Portland today. Is this, are we rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. What do you think of my beautiful city? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, you know, you come here at least once a year. Sure. And you've come here at least once a year for what now? Like More than 20 years. 20 years, because since I've been married. But I mean, here in Portland, you've come at least 10 years, right? Maybe yeah. more. Yeah. yeah. So you've been here year after year after year. What do you, what do you think about Portland now? Will this affect my video sales? <laughs> no. It's it's a wreck, man. Yeah. It's a shithole. Um, but not but I'm not picking on Portland because Seattle and San Francisco and Berkeley. Pick on Portland. It's okay to pick Port on Portland. You, 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 yeah. I drove you through downtown now. I mean, it's just yeah. It looks it, lo it looks like a refugee camp or a war zone, you know, basically. You mentioned something interesting too when you saw City Hall boarded up. Mm -hmm. City Hall and the police station. To me, are very in the government building. Yeah. Very symbolic locations for safety and security, and you know all those things. And when they put plywood everywhere, mm -hmm. it's it's a sign of capitulation. It's like we've given up. We're afraid. We're not gonna. We're not. We're not gonna stop this. We don't feel like we can. We can stop this. So we're just going to, you know put up boards and pretend it's not happening. We can't see you, you can't see us. It's, Can you imagine a worse no. symbol? No.